should have insisted of what Thomas Hall there. Because it, did it come to me in the tax office this morning? No. no. I, wasn't, I wasn't here. All right. Well, it was about oh, when, when was it? So have you heard from her recently? Yeah, we're friends. I saw her in New York last time I was How come we couldn't get her to... <laughs> what are we doing? Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cato Institute. I am Jason Kuznicki. I am the editor of Cato Unbound and Cato Books. And uh, we are here to talk about one book in particular, as you know, Scientocracy, the Tangled Web of Public Science and Public Policy. I am joined by the two editors of the book, Patrick Michaels and Terence Keeley, and also by uh, Holden Thorpe, who is the editor of the Science Family of Publications, the editor-in-chief. Uh, I will briefly introduce the uh, two book editors, and uh, they will present for uh, 10 minutes in the case of Pat Michaels and for uh, five in the case of Terence Keeley. And uh, we will then uh, transition to uh, Holden Thorpe, whom I will introduce at that time. So uh, to begin with, Pat Michaels is a senior fellow in the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He previously was a research professor of environmental sciences at the University of Virginia for 30 years and at Virginia State Climatologists for 27. He was president of the American Association of State Climatologists and program chair for the Committee on Applied Climatology of the American Meteorological Society, as well as director of the Center for the Study of Science at the Cato Institute. He has published numerous articles on climate or its impact in the peer-reviewed scientific literature and he is the author of nine books, including the recent Luke Warming, The New Climate Science That Changes Everything from Cato Books. He holds an AB and SM degree in biology and plant ecology from the University of Chicago and a PhD in ecological climatology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Dr. Terence Keeley is a professor of clinical biochemistry at the University of Buckingham in the United Kingdom, where he served as the president until 2014. The University of Buckingham is the only private university in the United Kingdom. As a clinical biochemist, Dr. Keeley studied human experimental dermatology. His work attracted funding from government, charities, and businesses. While doing his research, Professor Keeley learned how distorting government money could be to the scientific enterprise. In 1996, he published his first book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, where he argued that, contrary to conventional wisdom, governments need not fund science. Professor Keeley trained initially in medicine at Barts Hospital Medical School, London. He studied for his doctorate at Oxford University, and he lectured in clinical biochemistry at Cambridge University for many years. Please join me in welcoming Pat Michaels and Terence Keeley. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here again. Um, I'd like to thank Cato uh, in particular for the wonderful job that they did in putting together this book. This is a, a new format for them. It reads beautifully, and uh, it's just going to serve the Institute very, very well in the future. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to you about some of the seminal articles that gave rise to Scientocracy. Uh, it's relatively recent literature, but it's a very interesting one. And it starts off with a bang. In 2005, when John Ioannidis, now at Stanford University, publishes a paper, Why Most Published Research Results Are False. And in it, uh, he describes, I think, a fairly rigorous methodology to defend his main hypothesis from which emanate six corollaries. And the six corollaries are um, evidence for an incentive structure that has begun to evolve. Actually, it had been evolving for some time because he had to see a lot of, of things to get to where he would be to publish that paper. I'll just read three of the corollaries. Corollary three, the greater the number and the lesser the selection of tested relationships 
in a scientific field, meaning the fewer experiments that are done, the less likely the research findings are likely to be, are, are find, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Corollary five, and this has to do, I think, with very strong portions of the incentive structure, particularly in the academy. The greater the financial and other interests and prejudices in a scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Corollary six, the hotter a scientific field with more scientific teams involved, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Those corollaries are painting a picture that an accurate summary of a field with substantial implications, both scientific and policy, an accurate summary is liable to be a biased summary. That's a very frightening thing. Uh, then we discover Daniele Finelli in 2011, a graduate student at the University of Edinburgh, uh, publishing in the journal Scientometrics. Uh, the title said everything about the article. Negative results are disappearing from most disciplines and countries. This is an amazing article because it shows over nearly a 20 year period a, a significant increase in positive results, meaning this is my hypothesis. This is the data set I'm using. Here's how I treated the data and I can continue to support my hypothesis. Now in a real world that was not subject to some types of systematic distortions, this would be impossible. People are not getting significantly more intelligent over the last 20 years. I think a tour of the internet probably would convince you of that. Uh, notably, the tendency towards more positive results is non-existent pretty much in mathematics and very rare in the rarefied levels of physics. But as you go down more away from the dynamic and mechanistic sciences into the sciences where you're dealing more with statistical inferences, et cetera, the positive results go up. Well, there are good reasons for that because when you're given a menu of variables that can be manipulated in different operations that can be performed on them, you can get results that are significant, exhaust the degrees of freedom, if you will, in the data set and either not know you're doing it or choose to not recognize it. Um, there's evidence that this process could be called the American way. Uh, Ioannidis teamed up with Finelli in 2013 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and looked at a large number of literature reviews in which in one set all the authors were not Americans. In the other set there was at least one American author. And having at least one American author doubled the probability of generating a positive result. So why is there a pressure for a positive result? Well, I've been around academia for a while and uh, you learn that your five-year grant proposal is subject to renewal. It doesn't, it's not a five-year block usually. Publish a negative result, you are imperiling the renewal. In doing so, you're imperiling your career. So it is the incentive structure that is creating things that are quite problematic. Finally, Brian Nosek and his co-authors in 2015 published in Science uh, a paper called Estimating the Reproducibility of Psychological Science. Now his numbers have been challenged, but not completely challenged. They have been partially challenged, but I'll just read his numbers, quote, 97% of the original studies had significant results, positive results, if you will, P less than 0.05. When they replicated them, 36% of replications had significant results. So almost two thirds of the results could not be replicated. Uh, finally, uh, from the University of California at Merced, I bet nobody here knew there was a University of California. Did. You did, that's yes. pretty good. <laughs> it's yeah, it, pretty new. It's, 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 
it's yeah. pretty remote, too. Yeah. Uh, he published, now this is not in um, the Journal of Insignificant Research. He published this in Royal Society, Open Science, title, The Natural Selection of Bad Science, in which he uses an evolutionarily, evolutionary biological model uh, in which instead of children, children are papers. Uh, and the life of papers is the life of children, or the granddaughters or grandsons of papers are the children of the papers. Quote, researchers compete for prestige and jobs in which the currency of fitness, that's Darwinian fitness, whether you reach reproductive maturity, is number of publications. Again, the currency of fitness is number of publications. And more successful labs will have more progeny that inherit their method. So you can see here, uh, I know this is going to come out in the Q&A. There are many threads I'd like to draw about this. But I've gone through my time, and I think we'll have uh, a challenging time and hopefully an enlightening time uh, as we go through the afternoon. Thank you. So we deliberately arranged the format that we would speak for a relatively short period of time because we really wanted to throw this into a collective Q&A session. So we, Pat talked for actually rather less than 10 minutes. I should be talking for less than five. And you will be talking for as long as you want because you're our honored guest. <laughs> but what Pat has described is science under pressure. More than half of all published findings are false. More than half of all papers in psychology cannot be reproduced. And there seems to be the natural selection of bad science. What is the process of that natural selection? And uh, I want to bring in another author, Daniel Sarovitz of Arizona State University, who coined a very interesting expression. He said, it's technology that keeps science honest. And his thesis, and of course I completely agree with it since I've written about this so extensively, is that when after the Second World War in this country, the United States went from being a country that was stunningly laissez-faire in science, where the government funded no science that was meant to compensate for so-called market failure. It funded geopolitical science, a very small amount, but basically science was less than the private sector. Under those circumstances, which right up until actually nearly 1950, scientists reported to people who wanted results that could be tested. They either reported to the chief executive of a company whose airplanes should not fall out of the sky, they reported to the chief executive of American Heart Foundation, who actually wanted data that people got better with this drug or that. They reported to entities that were testing the science in terms of technology. But then, with the creation of the National Science Foundation in 1950 and the continuation of the earlier activities in the National Institutes of Health, the government crowded out huge sections of private funding of science and the government became a near monolithic, near monopolistic employer of scientists, which was a huge change. Universities went from being essentially teaching institutions to research institutions. It was a major development in American society and culture. And scientists no longer were tested by technology, or at least a large number are not. They were tested by peer review. The question, therefore, was if you submitted a grant, to a peer review panel, was that what the peer review panel wanted to read? If you submitted a paper to a journal, was that what the paper, the referees of the journal, wanted to read? If you wanted to get promotion in your university, were you saying the sort of things that people wanted to read? When science was being kept honest by scientists being tested against technology, they were forced to be honest. But when you're being judged by peer review, and when, as Pat has explained so well, so much of science is not hard, but soft and depends upon statistics. This is where the John Ioannidis stuff came in, how you can manipulate statistics to produce the majority of papers giving you false results. Then the incentives to researchers to manipulate, manipulate is too strong a word, to select the data that meets the requirements of peer review become very, very strong. 
And the whole thing becomes self-fulfilling because natural selection of bad science. These junior scientists are trained to meet the needs of the peer reviewers. Eventually themselves have become peer reviewers and so the whole thing carries on. In the 19th century, Planck said that science advances funeral by funeral. The assumption being that old scientists are always bound to paradigms which are often out of date, but as they die, so paradigms can shift relatively easily. But what we have when so much science is funded by the government, which by the way, there's no economic evidence that that does anything at all for the economy. In fact, it doesn't do anything for the economy. It just crowds out the private funding. When you create a single near monopolistic funder, which has one particular paradigm that has captured the group of funders. And in the book, for example, we talk about how nutrition research was absolutely captured under Ansel Keys by a group of people, all of whom were determined that the only stories they were going to perpetuate were those that fat was bad and carbohydrate was good. Then you get a natural selection of bad science. And so our argument is twofold. First, that science is facing not just a reproducibility crisis, but actually a credibility crisis. You pick up the New York Times, and today coffee's bad for you, and tomorrow coffee's good for you. This is bad for science. It doesn't look good. But it comes from a culture that government has hugely reinforced of scientists not being tested by technology, but being tested by peer review, which encourages an unhealthy culture. And I shall stop there, because the Q&As will be the opportunity to build on that. Our final presenter today is Holden Thorpe. He's the editor-in-chief of the Science Family of Journals. And prior to taking that position, he was the Rita Levy Montalcini Distinguished University Professor at Washington University at St. Louis. He was also the university's provost from 2013 until just this year. Prior to joining Washington University, Thorpe spent three decades at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he served as its chancellor from 2008 to 2013. A native of North Carolina, Thorpe earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry with the highest honors from the University of North Carolina. He earned a doctorate in chemistry at California Institute of Technology and completed postdoctoral work at Yale University. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I um, looked uh, extensively at the book and um, uh, I think, you know, obviously I'm about as much of the academic scientific establishment as, as you could find. Uh, proud to be that. Um, but there was probably more commonality uh, between me and the um, <coughs> arguments in the book than you might expect. Um, a lot of the things that are brought out, I agree, are significant. I don't agree on the right way to remedy them, um, but I certainly agree with the, the analysis of the various things that have happened over the years that have led us to this point where we are today. Science Magazine is uh, a very highly cited journal, along with Nature. We're the two most cited uh, general science journals there are, the only, uh, the only scientific publication that's cited more than Nature and Science is the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and it's true that uh, the desire to publish in our journal create, does induce behavior. There's no question about that. It's our job to try to make sure that that is behavior that is adding to the scientific record and to our understanding of nature. Um, but it is, uh, as, as has been brought out, something that we have to work uh, at constantly. Uh, folks like me believe that federal funding for science has enabled a huge amount of America's success for the last 75 years. Could these things have been done with private money? Uh, maybe. We don't know. We'll never be able to answer that. Uh, because we know what uh, government funding for science has done the last 75 years. Um, but I think one interesting readout, which uh, we probably differ on the origins of, but you know, DuPont and Kodak and Bell Labs used to have very important industrial 
basic science operations, and those are all gone now. In fact, when I went to graduate school, um, I told my advisor, he said, what do you want to do when you get out? I said, I want to go to Central Research and Development at DuPont. Fortunately for me, the time I was in graduate school was the time that this was wound down. So by the time I got out of graduate school, uh, I would decided on an academic career. And the reason that's good for me is I didn't end up going to DuPont and then having to go find another job, uh, as, as a lot of people who uh, went on that path before I did had to do. Uh, the authors do an excellent job of bringing out the fact that in 1945, Vannevar Bush, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harry Truman, and a number of other influential people in Congress uh, launched the federal funding of American science. And uh, we can d disagree about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but as I certainly agree with the authors that it was a major event in the history of America, one that probably doesn't get uh, as much attention as it deserves when we tell the story of the country. Um, and it has also induced other countries to invest a lot more in science. And right now, China is investing a huge amount in their scientific enterprise through their federal government with uh, a lot of direction from the federal government. But uh, judging from the things that come into uh, to me about papers that come from China, uh, their reproducibility crisis, if you want to call it a crisis, is worse than the one we have here. So, uh, you know, that's either an induction caused by what America has done or it's them realizing that they, if they want to be competitive, their government has to fund science the way America, America has done, depending on your uh, point of view. A lot of this debate, though, uh, as again, uh, Terrence said, I think uh, I would agree with, comes to uh, a very sloppy understanding of the difference between science and technology and policy in the public. Uh, as Terrence is saying, uh, science and technology are not the same thing. It's often that technology uh, evolves from science. Uh, but science is a living human process filled with human errors and judgments and interpretations uh, that is self-correcting. Um, but when it is applied too soon to technology or to policy, that's when you get a lot of the disconnects here. And I think it's fair to say that science has not done a good job uh, from our own side at helping the public understand uh, when we're turning away <laughs> still thinking about things and debating with each other and when they're applied. And again, I, I agree that uh, the pressure to produce, to get papers in my journal, <laughs> to get uh, promoted at your university causes us to be um, sheepish when we should be raising our hands saying, you know, this really isn't ready for you all to be doing this with this yet. Uh, science needs to get the courage to do that, and the fact that we're here having this conversation uh, is certainly part of that is, is on the scientific enterprise. Uh, you know, as far as just to put some of these debates in, in perspective, since there are a lot of them in the, in the book, uh, there are debates in physics that are just as vociferous as debates over climate or things in the social sciences. I mean, we used to think we knew how fast the universe was expanding the last five years or so. Now we don't. There are a lot of debates about the rate at which uh, the universe is expanding in my journal. Physicists are very uh, animated debating this with each other. Um, so you see debates about climate, but you, you, know, you don't see that because most people aren't in interested in what the application is of the rate at which the universe is expanding. We have something called dark matter. There's great debates about dark matter and, and what that is. So I guess I don't agree that physics is immune from this kind of thing. It's just it doesn't read out in society in, in the same way. Um, you know, there are plenty of things where if I was at a different think tank, I would be getting challenged on the other side. Uh, genetically modified crops are something where the left has been very critical of science. Uh, m many scientists, the majority, but not all, would, would agree that genetically modified crops are a very 
good thing for the world's food supply. Um, nuclear power <laughs> is another one where we lost track of that so long ago, the world would be a lot better place if we had more nuclear power plants and fewer coal plants. But science let the politics of that get away from us when you know, there was a chance we could have, have done that. Uh, vaccination is another area where um, we, we're probably going to have serious public health problems because of people doubting uh, us on vaccination. Um, and yet there, I think there's not a lot of scientific disagreement that uh, vaccines are safe and very important for public health. Um, still, you know, there are lots of things where I uh, am in agreement about, certainly about reproducibility. I believe INEDs and Brian Nozick, who, you know, as was said, published his paper in our journal, and we are in continuous dialogue with him about uh, new things that we can do together to strengthen science. I believe these folks are helping us. Uh, correct uh, things that we should have corrected. I don't think they spell the end of government funding for science. I think they uh, point us to, you know, making adjustments uh, in the way we've been doing things and coming up with stuff. Uh, salt and fat are an area where science absolutely failed. Um, and there, I think, again, it's this we're studying these things and publishing things, and people are communicating that to the public before it was ready. Uh, the other interesting thing about that is that um, we didn't know the underlying biochemical reason why salt and fat would be bad for you. Um, when we figured out sugar was the bad thing, it coincided with also when we understood the mechanism of why sugar is bad. You know, we now uh, have something we refer to as the microbiome. It's the trillions of bacteria and viruses and fungi that are living in your gut. They, the bad ones love sugar. That makes perfect sense. You could explain that to a 10th uh, a grade biology student, and that explains why sugar is poison and why there never was anything wrong with, with salt and fat. So there, the, that's an interesting one because not only is there this disconnect with the policy side, but also we never had the underlying mechanism. And now with the microbiome, we understand why, why sugar uh, is the thing. Um, the interaction of academic biomedicine with industry, I also agree, uh, can always use more work. But I uh, think the most important um, advances that we're the most excited about, cancer immunotherapy for sure and gene therapy, both came from NIH-funded academic research in American labs. Um, again, would have these have developed on their own? Uh, we don't know. Uh, and then finally, on, on climate, uh, the authors state, and I agree, that the, we definitely have warming. It's definitely caused by anthropogenic CO2. Um, we're, all three of us, I think, are in agreement about that. We need to be debating the extent and speed of the warming, what's going to be done to remediate uh, the earth, uh, what will the effects be on sea level and extreme weather, how are we going to respond to that. And I guess my appeal to all of us, including uh, the folks in my world, is that uh, we need to be having a sober, uh, careful, deliberate uh, conversation about that, um, you know, if, if we want the scenario where, yes, warming happens, but society does, we have geoengineering and we have, you know, things to um, make us safer in a world where sea level is higher, you know, if we're going to work on those things together, then we need to try to move beyond the politics of this. And even though I disagree with a lot of the things in the climate chapter, I commend the authors for stating clearly at the beginning of the book that anthropogenic CO2 is what's causing the warming. If we could get everybody on that to start from there, uh, this whole thing might be a little easier than it has been so far. So uh, I, I view all these uh, things just like uh, John Ioannidis and Brian Nozick as making science better. Uh, and that's why I came <laughs> today to uh, discuss this with all of you. And so 
while I disagree with a lot of the things in the book, I thank the authors for challenging science to raise to the occasion of explaining uh, what it is that we do and, and cannot do. <laughs> And to get a thank, thanks to all of you for coming to, to join in this conversation. Thank you very much for that. Um, as moderator, I am going to uh, ask first question. Moderator's prerogative is to do that, and I'm going to go for it. So. Scientific research is a response to ignorance. It is a response to what we don't yet know. And it is also, I would suggest, a process of spontaneous order in the Hayekian sense. And in this sense, it is very similar to the market process. Agents in the market also don't know something. They don't know whether their product will succeed or fail, but they have a hunch that maybe it will. They have a hypothesis, if you will. And they test that hypothesis by going to the market. In both of these processes, incentives matter. And what we're hearing today is a story about getting the incentives right. In both these areas of human action, the government has significant power to affect the incentives, to set goals, to reward certain behaviors, or to inhibit others. If it is true that technology keeps science honest, my question to the panelists would be, why not incentivize technologies as opposed to pure science? Why not, perhaps as a second best solution, why not institute prizes as opposed to grant money for pure research? And the prizes could be for uh, perhaps new methods of high-speed communication or travel or cures for diseases or certain very specific, concrete, verifiable technological advances which we would all want to have which don't yet exist. Uh, this might do a lot of the work of the patent system as well at much less cost and uh, therefore uh, be at least a second best if not a first best libertarian solution. So that's my question, and I will let the panelists think about it, because I threw out a lot there. But now I need to talk about the rules for how you will ask your questions. First, please wait to be called on. Second, please wait for the microphone, because we need everyone in the room to be able to hear, and we also need the people who are listening and watching online to be able to hear. Third, please identify yourself and any affiliation that you care to share. And Finally, please make sure that your question actually does contain a question and is not just a long speech. <laughs> All right, so uh, with those rules in mind, let's, uh, let's uh, first perhaps hear an answer to my question and uh, give you a chance to formulate your own. Well, um, do I talk in here? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Is this working? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, a slightly frivolous answer to your first question. Why don't we have prizes? Um, well, the British government famously had a prize for longitude. You may remember Harrison invented the chronometer. And one reason why governments shouldn't give prizes to people is that Harrison there had to fight the British government, I think for 35 years, to actually get the money out of them. I see some people nodding. So the British government proved to be extremely, as all governments so often are, extremely dishonest in actually distributing the money at the end of the day. Um, just as a comment, um, you're absolutely right about the similarities between spontaneous order and the market. In fact, Hayek stole the concept of spontaneous order from Michael Polanyi, who was a philosopher of science, who first described spontaneous order in science, and then Hayek borrowed the idea for, for the economy. Um, why not incentivize technology? I don't think the government should be there at all. Technology is incentivized by the market. So uh, those are my three immediate responses to that. I let the other two have their responses. Yeah, so um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't ascribe to the idea that the market would fill in the vast costs. I mean, when, when Darwin went on the Beagle, uh, which is the greatest thing that ever happened in science, in my view, um, 
he needed money. He, he was already landed gentry himself. He got money. Uh, he got sponsored to go on the Beagle for years. Um, and then he uh, wrote... I mean, it would be so great if we still did science this way in so many ways because the other thing about what he did was that the way he wrote it up was almost as important as what he discovered. But, you know, all he really needed, and, you know, those of us who have made pilgrimages to the various museums, you know, he had lab notebooks with specimens taped in them and drawings that he made. Um, and there's not a lot of science that gets done that way anymore. Uh, it, it caught, we spend uh, a, a lot of money on equipment and facilities, and uh, so if you incent the prize, but you don't provide an enabling mechanism for what happens getting up to that prize, it's not so clear to me uh, how you're going to get there, uh, because if you, if, if you drive over to a College Park, there's a lot of big buildings with equipment in them and uh, it's inefficient and it needs to be improved in the way that, that we said, but uh, right now the, the system of getting the knowledge that we do things with comes from those expenditures. I would, uh, <coughs> I'd like to talk about um, one of the aspects of this issue. If there is a prize that's discrete and probably attainable, with a specific solution in mind, then I think the reproducibility problem begins to decrease. And I will give you what I is in my mind has always been, hey, this is a real success of government science, which was what was done with acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Mm -hmm. I mean, here is um, a, a horrible disease, but an end a target. And so there was very little, so far as I can tell, perhaps you can correct me on this, there didn't seem to be very many scientific shenanigans in the course to getting to the end of that. No, well, there was the whole thing with Bob Gallo and the, uh, and the, the test and stuff, but the, the people who did the real work, I, I've, I, this has an uh, important place in my heart because the folks who did all the epidemiology were colleagues of mine at UNC who had a clinic in, in Africa. So on the one hand, I'm not objective, but on the other hand, I know a lot about this. Um, and yes, the, they were very focused. And again, it was another thing about the politics that are uh, surprising to some people. I mean, it was George W. Bush who did the PEPFAR funding that led to a great deal of that research. I can yeah. finish my answer and sure. say, um, where things begin to fall apart is where there are only nebulous goals and um, massive policy implications. And I think of, of my field on that. Um, there's something about to happen which is indicative of, I think, a problem. We know that, for reasons that I don't want to bore anybody with, that the climate models tend to predict much higher warming rates in the upper tropical atmosphere than are being observed. And that happens to be really important. And it's a very stark graph that John Christie has been running through the literature and penning uh, articles on. So we now have a new generation of models. They make it worse. The error is actually worse. Now, if there were not distortions going on in this field, that would not happen. But when you have models that have so many bells and whistles on them that you can push them in whatever direction you want, and it's very hard to verify on a future because the future's not here yet, as the fire sign theater said, uh, it's, it's a recipe for irreproducible science. In climate, when I say irreproduc irreproducible, I mean it doesn't produce what happens. All right, I think uh, we should open to audience questions now. I believe I saw your hand first. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Uh, my name is Herman Bauma with the National Association for Objectivity in Science. And uh, Mr. Thorpe referred to uh, Mr. Darwin. Darwin was very big on having a robust debate on his theory. Some of the most eminent scientists of the time had strong scientific arguments to, against his theory. And he discussed them in his book, The Origin of Species. About a third of his book is spent discussing those arguments. Um, interestingly, last April, I was scheduled to give a presentation at the National Science Teachers Association about Darwin's response to objections to his theory. And I was shut down, my presentation was shut down 15 minutes before I was to begin. I think a big problem in science today, mainstream science, is this fear of debate. Uh, I think if we had more debate, um, there'd be more respect for science. I think uh, these issues would be, uh, uh, you know, as the, the, the science behind the various contentions would be clearer. So I think I would recommend the AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science, and other mainstream organizations to promote more debate, either live debates or book debates in a book about climate change, about um, scientific issues with uh, theory of evolution, and a lot of these other controversial subjects. Um, so my question is, do you all think that would be helpful if there was actually more of a debate being uh, supported by, uh, by mainstream science. Absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And there is a move towards openness in science, but I'd be very happy if every scientific paper had a forum at the bottom where people could comment on it. Peer review is far too limited. I would also be much happier if scientific journalists were more serious. I mean, you can still read in major newspapers reports of scientific advances, and yet you can't actually get the original reference, the original paper from that newspaper report. It'd be lovely to see much more criticism of scientific papers. Too many science journalists see themselves as re just reporting, look, this exciting paper's come out. It'd be much nice, nicer to see really critical analysis of papers in the media. So I agree with everything you said. Me too. Uh, I, I, I think it is a sad trend in areas where there are groups of people who have one point of view and groups of people who might have another point of view, that uh, invariably it seems that one group tries to shut down debate. And that's how it's won. I think that's unhealthy. I think it leads towards horrific policy. And from what I've seen, uh, in my area, it's getting worse. This is, this is not, not a way to run a railroad, boss. Yeah, and I, I think, for, well, for one thing, I think that social media is creating a very different environment for debate uh, within the scientific community, for sure. And we're seeing that very much uh, with papers that we publish, and we're making a uh, greater and greater efforts as time goes on totally. to put more of the, uh, as much of the primary data, the code that's used to generate the data, um, all of these things out there and available so that other people can uh, take the code and the data and the images and, and run their own analyses. I think, um, and so debating the interpretation of, uh, observations, I think, is something that I agree needs to happen more. Um, but I also think that there, where this gets challenging for scientists is the difference between interpreting observations and, the observa and debating the observations themselves. I mean, there are certain things that we can observe that we uh, know to be true. And then there are things that we extrapolate to that are interpretations of those observations. And uh, where this, uh, these disagreements become challenging is when uh, the line between whether we're interpreting the observations or whether we're challenging the observations themselves uh, gets called 
out into the open. So for example, as, as we uh, have said, um, we know the Earth is warming. I think it's 0.9 degrees Celsius since 1970. I'm not a climate scientist, so uh, I'm the least qualified person up here to debate the, the models and all that. Uh, but we, we know that. That's an observed fact. And I, there's an excellent consensus that human-generated CO2 is the cause. But as I said, you know, there's a, there are important debates to be had about uh, is there a way to remediate the effects of this more so than some of the worst scenarios that you hear about sea level or extreme weather or something like that? Is there a way, you know, as has been said, are the models right about what they're projecting in terms of how much warming we're going to have? Those are... Uh, things that the scientific world is certainly debating. They're being debated in my journal. But it's not being de debated among scientists that the Earth is warming or that uh, CO2 produced by human activity is the cause. So I don't know. That's, th that would be my take on your question. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you all for your comments. I'm Samuel Breslow. Um, my question is going back to incentive structures. And so I'm curious about um, two of the sorts of incentive paradigms that we have outside of science itself. Um, the first being the media, um, which we've already touched on somewhat, and the second being uh, market forces and big business. Um, so I'm wondering for both of those, what are the, um, do you have any suggestions for what we could do to encourage a better reporting on scientific discoveries that more accurately mirrors the conversation that's happening within scientific communities, and B, how um, we can reduce the effect that um, a lot of big business lobbying has had, um, for instance, by the sugar industry, as was brought up earlier, um, that can distort the findings of scientific research. Thanks. That's a very complicated question, <clears throat> uh, and I think Terrence can, can answer it. I'm not, I'm not throwing it on you yet. Don't worry. <laughs> Terrence can answer it from the, the sugary perspective. Uh, I would like to answer it from the media perspective. Now, there's a person that, that um, Holden, I'm sure, knows, uh, who was the editor of a journal a major journal, it thought generally to be the third line general science journal in the United States behind science and nature, and that's the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a biochemist, actually a cell biologist by the name of Randy Schechtman. Randy Schechtman went and did something pretty impressive. He got himself a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine, and the day that he received his award, he published an op-ed in the London Guardian, believe it or not. And what he said in the op-ed, and this goes to your question, as if it seems like I'm circling, I'm about to hit. Uh, what he said in the op-ed is, I'm not sending any more manuscripts to nature, science, or cell, cell being his more specialty journal. And, the, and, and his reasoning was that these journals are seeking television hits and publicity and impact factors. And in doing so, they're funding or they're publishing what Schechtman called, quote, flashy, end quote, science. So what happens when a scientist publishes in science, nature, or to a lesser extent, penis, as we call it, uh, is that their probability of career success goes up dramatically. Um, they're probably not going to fly and coach for a while, and they're going to get grant money. So that means that scientists gravitate towards the flashy fields. And as Schechtman pointed out, that crowds out. There's a lot of science out there that's not going to make the TV that's really, really important to you 
really important, will, will be important to you biomedically, doesn't make a good TV show, but those practitioners are going into other areas. So my answer to you is about the media and to show that it's a very complicated relationship. It's not just media distortion. It's the, commun the, the practitioner community deciding to go along with this. Sure, let me, let me also take your point. Um, for example, big business, there's no question. Someone recently said that sugar is the new tobacco and you can no more trust a paper that comes out of the sugar industry than you could 50 years, or indeed today, trust a paper that comes out of the tobacco industry. Um, Marion Nestle, who's the professor of nutrition at New York University, for a short time worked for the federal government. And her first day on the job, and she writes about this, she'd obviously made a deep impression on her. She was told, the one thing you're not allowed to do in this job is ever to recommend eating less of any foodstuff because the producers of that food stuff will be onto your local congressman the next day and sheer hell will descend upon us. So the reality is that the way to understand a scientific paper is to move away from the idea so many of us have that a scientific paper is a neutral, disinterested, like a judge trying to come to a truth. The way to view a scientific paper is to see it as a piece of advocacy it's the lawyer for the defense or the lawyer for the prosecution in court. And it's very much a biased perspective that suits the interests of the funders and the researchers and the institutions. The way to view science is as a constant battle between biased, people very rarely lie, but people select data carefully. And no paper is a final statement. It's only a move towards where you're going to get. And one of the reasons I'm opposed to the government funding of science is that it introduces much more of a monopolistic single paradigm. The NSF, and um, uh, Holden was very generous about this. He admitted very graciously that you know, food and fat and carbohydrate, all that was wrong for 40 years. But one of the reasons it was so wrong, there was only one source of knowledge, which was the NSF and the NIH. And it was the same people in both of them constantly propagating the same story. It is fascinating that the nutrition story was smashed in the end by three journalists. It wasn't scientists, it was journalists coming out and saying, we can't carry on, you know, need side trolls and people like that. So what we need to render science more honest in this sense is much more pluralistic funding, much less funding from government, much more funding from foundations and industry, much of which has been crowded out by government, though I'm not sure Holden would agree with me with that, but I think the evidence is quite good, so that we can have much more pluralistic funding because papers can't be trusted as, as disinterested. They are always to be seen as pieces of advocacy. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just say a few things. I mean, it's my job to try to do something about all these things these guys are saying. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't agree that the remedy is to, to blow up the whole system, but certainly some of the problems that are being uh, described here are real. And uh, <clears throat> for example, <laughs> it is true that if you get a science or nature paper, uh, it is a career maker. Um, we always say among our group, you know, we don't understand how we got to be the, the gatekeepers uh, to this. Um, but I, I believe the reason is because <clears throat> the universities are big and complicated places and they basically outsource the, the evaluation of, the, of science to us. Um, and in a way, that's probably a more efficient system than if the universities tried to uh, build some kind of evaluation function for themselves. So, um, you know, I, I, and in a way, since there's commercial interests in publishing, science is nonprofit, but nature, for example, is for profit. It is a place where private industry is doing a function for universities in lieu of them setting up probably a more complicated lumbering bureaucracy uh, that would be even more inefficient uh, if they did it. But that doesn't, none of that changes the fact that there's a huge incentive uh, for people to publish in my journal uh, and that the media does rely on our evaluation uh, to provide things that they're going to write about. Uh, and we, you know, I've only been on the job six weeks, so we'll see how I, I do, but my job is to try to strengthen what we're doing in a way that um, alleviates the concerns 
uh, that you know the objective concerns that that are you know being uh, raised here uh, correctly. And then, as far as the nutrition thing is concerned, uh, the salt, the big salt news article, uh, I think ran in our journal. Wasn't it Gary Taub's paper oh, was in Science? Was in science. Yeah. Yep. So Gary Taubes is the, the journalist who did the most on the whole salt thing, and he wrote about another problematic piece of science that I talked to him about one time. Um, and he's an outstanding journalist, and we were proud that that paper ran in our uh, magazine, that article ran in our magazine. So uh, I think that shows that despite all of these problems, um, you know, w we are willing to, to correct ourselves uh, maybe not as efficiently as we should, but in that case, certainly we did. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Hi, um, Richard Williams. I'm uh, retired from FDA and also from, also from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm writing a book about FDA. But I don't want to talk about nutrition, even though I am writing about it. Uh, I wanted to talk about government funding because I've only recently discovered uh, DARPA which is a form of government funding. They bring in people for a couple of years. They fund particular studies that are quote unquote defense related, but then we've gotten all kinds of wonderful things out of DARPA like GPS and a lot of computer technology. I wonder if you think that maybe this, if you're going to have any kind of government funding, we can learn something from the DARPA model. Well, um, let me say this, if you look, one of the standard defenses of the government funding of science is its economic value. Uh, America, the United States of America, is an extraordinary control experiment. It, between 1776, unfortunate event, and, <laughs> and 1950, the American government did not fund science, essentially. It funded geopolitical science. You know, it, it funded defense science, and it funded agriculture to keep the farmers' votes. But essentially, there was no sense in the United States of America that the role of government was to compensate for so-called market failure. And then in 1950, like a light switch, suddenly America government, federal government, becomes the largest science funder in the world. And you have vast expansion of lands. If you look at what's called total factor productivity, which is an economic measure of productivity, nothing happens. If you look at rate of growth of GDP per capita, nothing happens. There is simply no measurable output to the government funding of science. Indeed, if you look at the OECD, which is an intergovernment organization, in 2003, they published a survey, Sources of Growth in OECD Countries, and they found that although there was a very good correlation between the private funding of R&D and national GDP per capita growth, not only was there no correlation between public funding in each country and GDP per capita growth, there was actually a negative correlation because the public funding had crowded out the private funding, i.e. people were being taken from the private sector into the public sector. So although you can always come up with anecdotes like DARPA, and there's a woman called Mariana Mazzucato who has made a career of these anecdotes, the reality is, and we all know this, that science is always moving along a broad front. Thomas Edison you know, submitted a patent for the light bulb in the morning. That very afternoon, another inventor came with a, with a patent application. I think there were 36 applications for light bulbs that year across the globe. Science is moving across the national front. And if government's going to do something, then it's going to fund useful stuff. Some of the stuff it's going to fund is going to be useful. But the question you have to ask yourself is, if there was no government funding of the private sector, would there be any different? DARPA, you know, distributed computing was a, was a technology whose time had come. If the airplane had been successfully launched by the Smithsonian Institution, we'd all be told we wouldn't have an airplane but for the public funding of science. As it happens, the Wright brothers did it, but no one goes around saying that proves the government shouldn't fund science. The whole argument is hugely skewed. So no, I don't think government should fund science. <laughs> uh, down front, yes. Uh, Richard Coleman, class of 68. Chapel Hill. Go Hills. Yeah. Um, the public really, we, we have a, we can't be expected to understand really a lot of what science is working on now. Uh, but there's scientific orth orthodoxy, which is still confounding to other scientists. And I'm thinking Einstein with the quantum physics and uh, uh, is there a case among you three, there where there's something that 
you know, you're scientists and you know the scientific method and you know what the orthodoxy is and you say, uh, I still can't believe it. <laughs> Quantum physics. Well, sure. Um, I mean, I think that anybody who's a serious scientist is a skeptic. Uh, and it, the bar to, first of all, you never, you never really believe something if you're, I think, an, uh, a real scientist. You, you'll tentatively continue to entertain the hypothesis because you know it's, it's, you know that it can change. Uh, and I think that's the bar that has been lowered in the policy relevant science fields when uh, politics enters in. And I think that's extremely dangerous. Uh, it is why I'm hoping that science will foster more learned debate not yelling at each other, but learned debate in their hallowed pages, uh, and maybe we can we can begin to go forward to diffuse uh, the intensity of the political inferno that is raging over some of these issues. I'm going to respond to a question, and I look forward to Holden's response to to my response. Obviously, anyone who thinks they understand quantum physics is by definition insane because <laughs> human beings can't understand it. Um, I think there's one role for the government funding of science, which is very important, which is to challenge and confront. I'd be much happier if governments funded science for the specific purpose of taking on big sugar, big tobacco. I, I, many people in this room will know, and I, I tell the story with reluctance because it's an unpleasant story. So. Let me preface my remarks by saying I'm about to say something unpleasant, and I, I don't want anyone to think I'm endorsing what I'm about to say. But the person who discovered that cigarettes killed you was, of all people, Adolf Hitler. It was Adolf Hitler who, in 1933, when he came to power, said to his epidemiologists, I just know that cigarettes are bad for you. Go out and prove it, or something bad might happen to you. <laughs> And the epidemiologists of the day were astonished how easily the data fell out. They, they were, everyone believed in those days that cigarettes were good for you because you know, they, they cleared the lungs with all that phlegm. And Richard Doll, who got all the glory in England, he knew about the Nazi literature, but he knew that no one else was reading the Nazi literature, and so he was very happy to take the credit for rediscovering what he already knew to be there. But the point I am making is I would be very happy to see government science genuinely skeptical and confront all the vested interests, including other government departments. And I wonder, Holden, what you think about that? Uh, w well, if, if things are, and I'm not gonna comment on the whole thing about Nazi Germany, <laughs> um, but if, if science is working well, it's, it's criticizing itself. Uh, and I can give you some examples of some things that I didn't think were going to work that did. I mean, I, I have been working in the biotechnology business, um, you know, for a long time, longer than I've been, was in administration, or certainly longer than I've been running a journal. And um, I've seen a lot of things come and go. Uh, I did not think gene therapy was going to work. The first gene therapy studies, uh, there were deaths. Uh, I couldn't fig I couldn't, for the life of me, understand you know how you get enough cells <laughs> uh, transformed. Um, the enzymology of it seemed so complicated uh, in terms of how you get new nucleic acid into double-stranded DNA. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of people who persisted with the adeno-associated virus. And now uh, we're seeing a lot of success with gene therapy. And, um, you know, I was, I was wrong <laughs> that whole time. Uh, and in fact, I, you know, I told my colleagues who were in the investment world that it wasn't a smart thing to invest in. Fortunately, they didn't take my advice. Um, you know, I think um, monoclonal antibodies is another one where when we first got monoclonal antibodies, we thought everything was gonna be an antibody drug. We'd just get mice to produce the drugs. It was all, we're gonna have a drug for everything. 
uh, was 15, 20 years between then and um, when we had monoclonal antibodies. And the thing that's interesting about these two stories is the government funded it, science overpromised monoclonal antibodies and gene therapy, but then everybody forgot about it for 15 years. And then when it worked, then you know now we're all happy that we that we have cancer immunotherapy and and Remicade and and uh, that gene therapy is going to straighten out a lot of uh, orphan diseases and things like that. So that's to me a, a model of it, it working fairly well, and where a lot of the tendency of science to be in the flashy journals and overpromise kind of dissipated in the right way, and some. Uh, hard-working, earnest folks soldiered away until they had it worked out, and now we have, you know, things that have really changed and improved human life that have come from that uh, process. And I think, you know, when you get to a nutrition or climate change um, or some of the other things that we've been talking about, you know, we don't have the luxury <laughs> of letting this play out in the way that it has, and we need to and I, you know, I, I take certainly some of the blame onto science itself for the fact that we haven't figured that out. So um, I'm just going to briefly add something here because I'm a historian and we've touched on some historical topics. Uh, yes, it's true that Hitler and the Nazis were very negative about smoking, but uh, the idea that smoking might maybe be bad for you was a popular belief that goes way, way back. James I of England in the early 17th century said that he thought smoking was bad. He wanted to prohibit it. He wasn't sure if he could and if it was already too popular. He ended up giving the monopoly for tobacco pipes to his court jester as a, <laughs> a, a sign of his contempt. Uh, so popular, popular ideas about smoking had been around for a long time and uh, there was you know, obviously the pro-smoking camp and they were all smoking and there was the anti-smoking camp who were saying, well, maybe this is actually not a good thing way, way, way back in history. Oh, cool. um, but uh, what, what happened in the case of smoking is that it turns out the science did validate popular beliefs. That's not always the case. Uh, one example much more recently is that popular belief turned very strongly against psychedelic drug use in response to the excesses of the 60s. And it turns out that the prohibition on not just the use of psychedelic drugs, but on the research of scientific drugs, or scientific, psychedelic drugs, rather, uh, has caused uh, a huge uh, opportunity, apparently, to be missed. There's been a lot of very promising research about use of psychedelics for uh, psychotherapy, for overcoming things like depression and PTSD, for uh, ultimately reconciling people to their own mortality. And uh, the research on this in recent years, which has only lately been allowed, uh, has been much, much delayed from when it might have been done. So uh, it, is, it is possible that uh, popular belief and a too hasty scientific judgment too hasty exercise of scientific authority can uh, lead us astray as well. Jason, I should allow that, that we do have an extensive chapter by Trevor Burris yep. uh, in this book on this very subject. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you so much for the interesting discussion and for taking my question. Um, your comments make me think of the rise of the anti-vaccination movement uh, in the US, which I read as a handful of individuals claiming scientific authority where maybe they lack an empirical basis to do so. Um, and I think we can point to um, the resurgence of measles this year as evidence of that. Um, and I, I'm also wondering that, um, that this phenomenon has been um, exacerbated by the mainstream media framing the vaccination debate as a debate, um, thereby elevating um, anti-vax uh, viewpoints to, uh, you know, to the same scientific validity as pro-vaccine viewpoints. Um, so my question is not uh, whether people should be required to get vaccinations, I think that's outside the scope of this discussion, but rather um, how anti-vax sentiment uh, factors into 
um, the viewpoint advocated in the book, which is a polycentric and decentralized one. Um, I'm just wondering how that uh, factors into your thinking. Thanks. You're in the back. Oh. Do, do, do you want just Colin? Do you want to answer for the first time? Okay, <laughs> sure. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. So, uh, yeah, I certainly agree with you that. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, we have a tragic thing uh, playing out here. Measles is on the rise, and we just published a pair of papers showing that um, that measles causes what we call immune immunity. That is, it causes uh, the appearance that your immune system has forgotten uh, how to inoculate you against a, n a number of other things. And so uh, it isn't just the spread of the measles that's worrisome. It would be other infectious diseases uh, that uh, humans might have acquired immunity to other, you know, through evolution, that uh, if they get the measles, young children get the measles, they then will be susceptible to other infections. So th this is a very serious uh, situation and um, I guess uh, in terms of saying what science has done that has opened the door for this, uh, again, I think the fact that we have allowed a lot of this confusion between when science is ready to be technology and when science is ready to be applied to policy, because we've been lazy <laughs> about articulating that, mostly out of fear that if we say, you know, science isn't always ready to do these things that we'll get less money for it, which is what these guys are, are alleging, and certainly some of that is, is true. Um, th that science has not done a good job of helping people understand uh, when, when we have an issue like vaccination uh, and when we have an issue like... Um, you know, w whether salt is bad for you or not, which, you know, we got applied long before we really knew the answer. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Myron Ebel, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, this is a very important top topic, and I think this is a terrific book. Uh, I got my copy free, but I urge everyone else here to buy one or several. Um, I want to ask about or have your comments on the role of the scientific establishment in corrupting the policymaking process. And uh, here's, I, I'll leave out the national climate assessments and the endangerment finding. The most outrageous single example of this uh, that's easy to explain is uh, the EPA's use of two secret studies on fine particulate matter. PM 2.5. Now, the House Science Committee subpoenaed the EPA during the Obama administration for the data and the methodology between, behind two secret studies that are used to justify PM 2.5. Uh, Gina McCarthy testified under oath, and it was a condition of her confirmation as EPA administrator that she would turn it over. She thumbed her nose. When the uh, Trump administration came in, uh, the EPA uh, proposed a rule on scientific transparency that said, we're not going to use secret studies anymore. And immediately, 60-some uh, organizations, I think led by the AAAS, wrote a letter. I, I mean, it was like a few days later. And the letter said, the first sentence was, we strongly oppose EPA's efforts to restrict the use of the best available science in its policy making and encourage EPA to withdraw its proposal. The sentence should have said, we strongly oppose EPA's efforts to restrict the use of the worst available science, and yet the whole scientific establishment has locked arms and said, we're not going to give up on this. Well, I don't have much to say except I signed that letter and I believe what's in it. You guys go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I think you are obviously touching upon an important subject matter. And um, there are three chapters in this book, Scientocracy, that are related uh, 
to what you're talking about. One is on PM 2.5, and Jason Johnston has shown uh, definitively that there's not a lot of there there on the issue. The other two <clears throat> are something that we haven't talked about <clears throat> in this discussion very much, and it's how scientists can self-appoint themselves to self-referential authority and establish things that create a desired political result. And not a lot of people know that the uh, largest, I believe it's the largest uranium deposit in the United States, is about 180 miles south of here. It's in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania County, Virginia, up against the North Carolina border. It's very accessible. It's so accessible that you can actually pick some of it off the surface. Uh, and the, this, the deposit was discovered on a remarkable day. I don't know if you know this. Mm. Uh, it was discovered the day that Three Mile Island had its accident ah. and the week that the China Syndrome was playing in yes. the movie theater. <laughs> And so the political process rolled, ro rose up, say, oh, oh, we can't mine that uranium. I don't know. There's a, we're going to pass a moratorium on uranium mining in the state of Virginia. And so the guy, all this uranium is under one guy's property by the name of Walter Coles, Sr. And Coles wants to mine his uranium because the price is becoming right. So what does he do? He says, I want to do this right and safe. And so he goes to the National Academy of Sciences, Nat 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 National Research Council, and says, can you, you know, give us the definitive word on how to mine this safely and all that stuff? And they said, well, we'll try. We don't know, but uh, please send us a check for however million to write the report. Um, and what happened was the report was clearly a politically driven report um, to prevent Mr. Coles from exploiting this huge deposit. Um, I know because one of the chief citations in it was me. And it was a document in which I said nothing of the sort that the National Research Council report said that I did. So that's abuse of scientific authority. And the other one that we're seeing is the w w people seem to like electric cars. They have a lot of copper in them. The world's largest copper, gold, and molybdenum deposit is 100 miles, no, 200 miles west of Anchorage and land zoned by the state of Alaska for mining. It's part of the deal to, to, uh, with, with uh, the federal government. And the EPA did a similar trick to what the National Research Council did on uh, Virginia uranium. In this case, they got a group of folks together to build a hypothetical mine that would never be approved in today's permitting process and say, aha, this is going to pollute Bristol Bay, which is the world's largest pristine Chinook salmon fishery. And you know what? This mine never been permitted. It's in the permitting process today. It might get permitted. But these are huge things. The value of the takings that occurred in Virginia, and this case is working its way through the court now, will be the largest takings case against the federal government in the history of the United States. And this is science gone wild. And I'd like to know what we're supposed to do about it, because it's a real problem. Well, let me just rehearse the, or I don't expect to win anyone over with this, but the reason that we wrote the, the letter, uh, which I didn't sign, there's two. Um, there was one signed by, written by my predecessor, um, and then one that we did just a few weeks ago, because uh, it looks like there's an excellent chance these rules could be put in place, you know, against our objections. Um, that there are, and this is setting aside any individual study, but the general concept 
of using health data to make decisions when all of the data have to be disclosed means that there's not a lot of health data that are going to be used to make uh, these kinds of decisions because in today's world with 23andMe and Ancestry.com and facial recognition software and a lot of other things, um, it's almost impossible to anonymize the data sets that are used to, to do these, to make these conclusions. And so to say that um, we're not going to use health data uh, to uh, craft regulations, um, you know, we feel is, uh, is excluding uh, a lot of valuable science from the process. Oh, I, did, I, did, I said I didn't expect to win too many people over, but that was the argument. <laughs> yes. Pete Kurtzenhauser, I'm a Cato donor. Okay. Um, Dr. Thorpe. Yes. Should your journal not publish papers, particularly flashy papers, until they have been replicated? And Drs. Keeley and Michaels, I'd like to hear your counter responses. Yeah, so uh, we, um, we rely on reviewers to um, evaluate uh, the data in the paper based on their experience and expertise. We have two stages of review. Uh, one, the preliminary stage where we decide if we're going to do a detailed review, that's done by outstanding academic experts and same thing with the review. We do not <laughs> ask the reviewers to repeat the experiments. Um, and a lot of the times when things don't replicate, people say uh, that, you know, the reviewers failed. Well, no, we didn't ask the reviewers to replicate the experiments. Uh, if we did that, uh, we'd have a lot less science in the world. Uh, we could debate whether that'd be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but uh, I think it would be hard for the way the system is set up right now, it's not clear who has the incentive to do the replication. So what happens is, if it's important enough and interesting enough, somebody tries to replicate it, and if it's something people just enjoy reading and it kind of doesn't drive science forward, it never gets replicated. Uh, is that the system we want? We, you know, we can debate that, but I, I gave you a pretty transparent description of the whole thing. Holden, I think that you make a very good point. Uh, when, a guy, when a person is reviewed for progress at the university, they're not going to get any kudos for replicating someone's paper yeah. unless it's a dynamite paper. And so therefore, there is not an incentive to replicate. Uh, there is a, a new string emerging, though, online where there are some pretty smart cookies who aren't necessarily exactly in a field but are quantitatively proficient. And we're seeing, um, in my field, uh, guys like Steve McIntyre, et cetera, do very, very good work criticizing uh, certain methodologies that have been used elsewhere. But the, the problem is that it's not, it's not incentivized. And there was a woman from NIH whose name escapes me who wrote extensively on this problem being one of the reasons that people who have uh, maybe an orphan disease or a serious disease are promised that the cure is just around the corner. Our preliminary experiment shows this, and then it never shows up because it can't be replicated. No, it can't be replicated, or it's just that the, the findings are so early in the process that when, when these things are going to pay off hasn't been honestly articulated. Um, yeah, there's uh, another person you all can see online. Her name is Elizabeth Bick, B-I-K. Her Twitter feed is Microbiome Digest. Uh, I follow her intensely because, uh, um, you know, my approach with folks like her uh, is to engage. Um, I want to know what she's going to tweet about our papers as soon as I can find it out so I can figure out what to do. Uh, she tweeted recently that, you know, somebody asked her, uh, what can we do to help you? And she said, well, I need a list of all the journal's editors 
emails. So I immediately responded to her tweet and said, my email is hthorpe at triplas.org. Uh, I would, you know, uh, I, I don't, I think in the long run, this is healthy for science. I think I have confidence that we will adapt uh, to, uh, to this and that science will be stronger in the long run. Very briefly, just very briefly. Um, in the early days of the scientific enterprise, experiments were communal. The Royal Society, an experiment would take place and the other fellows would be watching. Um, and it was viewed, people felt that that should be a communal because you could never trust an individual. Leeuwenhoek, you know, the great Dutch scientist, when he used to send his papers to the Royal Society, he would attach affidavits from distinguished members of the community who would confirm that they had seen the same things under the mic. So, and then what happened in science, peer review in the early years, peer review wasn't really about a methodological analysis. Peer review was really, is this person, very sexy as well, is this person a gentleman? Can we trust this person? Does someone know this person? That's what peer review really was. Only very recently has peer review become this, I think, greatly overestimated analysis of the technical ability of the paper because I don't think it really can do that. The great danger of peer review, I think, is that we give too much credit to something that's gone through the peer review process. I, I repeat what I said earlier. I, I think that, I mean, I think Holden's right. I think this is the price you pay, rather like limited liability is the price you pay for capitalism. There's a real downside to it, but overall you get more capitalism. And I, I think Holden is right. The way we do science at the moment, it's probably the way of getting the fastest stuff out. But there's a real downside, which is that, as I said, I think you have to look at every paper. You have to ask yourself, is this really true, this paper, or is it just a piece of advocacy? So we are about out of time, but I'll have one more question. I'll take one more question. Yours. Yes. So you guys have been talking about um, primarily about the hard science, the hard sciences, biology and, and, and physics, and I guess environmental science is a hard science. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> um, a great deal of government spending is driven by social science. And I'm wondering what thoughts you have about how the phenomenon you've been describing. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Catherine Stevens, and I'm a, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. My policy area is early childhood. Uh, so this might be at the top of the list of, of, a, of, a, of a policy arena in which a great deal is uh, a great deal of policy occurs on the basis of, of not much research, in my view. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the comparison with social science. Well, uh, as uh, Finelli showed, the as sciences become more gov more adjudicated by statistics and sampling, as opposed to dynamics and and hard theory and mathematics, that's where the, it's easiest to create um, what I would call bad knowledge. Uh, you know the term p-hacking. Okay. If you have a lot of variables in a model uh, and it doesn't, you're not getting the result you want, you can maybe do some transformations of the variables and, you know, if you have 20 variables, one of them is going to be significant at the 0.05 level on the average all the time. If every time you, you manipulate a variable, you're essentially producing another one. And so you get a few significant variables in some social science study. And then the paper gets written like this. We hypothesize that X is the cause of Y. Well, you didn't hypothesize that X is the cause of Y. You found that if you manipulated X in a certain way, it would be correlated with Y in a significant fashion. This is unfortunately a truth. I know that statistics instructors in graduate programs try their best to <coughs> keep this from happening, but unfortunately many of these areas are policy relevant and Bad science gives you bad policy, and that's one of the things we're talking about in this book. Some, something should be done about the social sciences. The, the, the level of, I mean, in my field... Terrence, that's a little authoritarian, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's unfair 
is that in the field that I've become an, an expert, I've studied a lot of nutrition. Uh, I now know which scientists I believe and which scientists I know I can't believe. And some of these are really distinguished names and really distinguished institutions. And it's very unfair because the vast majority of people can't be expected to, to make that sort of judgment. But something should be done about the social sciences. And I'm sure Holden would completely agree we can't carry on with the situation where most psychology papers we know cannot be reproduced. I mean, that, that's a real crisis in psychology. Something should be done about that. We all know, we all have ideas about it, but the first thing is to recognize there's a problem. Yeah, we publish uh, psych social science uh, in our journal, um, and we spend a lot of time talking about this. And we've had some high-profile cases uh, of our own, not, not as many as um, uh, journals completely devoted to psychology would have uh, of this kind of thing. And I think there's two elements to it. Uh, one is um, the human frailty <laughs> uh, in, uh, you know, wanting a particular result. There's certainly some of that. But there's also really a rethinking that needs to be done of, you know, what it means that, what, uh, that something is statistically significant. Um, you know, I, I need to read a lot more of the history of social science to understand why P being 0 0.05 is some uh, important thing. Uh, I don't know how 0 0.05 got picked. I need to, I, sh I should know that, but I've only been on the job six weeks, so that's an important thing for me to find out. Um, but I, I think if, if, if the test is that P is 0 0.05, then we're gonna have a lot of things that aren't gonna be repeated because by definition, there's a finite probability that you wouldn't be able to repeat that, not because of any human error at all. And so, um, uh, I think that a big thing that Ioannidis and, and Nozick uh, and their coworkers are bringing up is, is that there's uh, an intrinsic statistical fluctuation, uh, uncertainty, that we really haven't dealt with when we announce that social scientists found something to have this correlation when to us, you know, who know statistics, we know that means there's the next, you know, there's a f substantial chance that it won't, wouldn't be repeated, but we don't do a very good job at all of conveying that. Okay, uh, I have uh, one final set of brief announcements to make as moderator. Uh, first, the reception will be held in the Winter Garden, located in the lobby area, immediately following the presentation. Second, restrooms are located on this level, also out in the lobby to the left of the elevators. And finally, as a courtesy to our panelists, please allow them to make their escape from the auditorium <laughs> before you engage them in conversation, perhaps even allow them to get a drink. They will be available at the reception, as I understand, in order to discuss further. So Jason, please, uh, we also, I will also please join me in thanking them. Oh, oh yes, and there will be book signing as yeah. well. <laughs>